acknowledging that as we gather virtually, we are on the ancestral homelands of indigenous peoples who have lived on these lands since time immemorial. Please join me in expressing our deepest respect and gratitude for our indigenous neighbors. Uh, this call is being recorded. Um, this is a Zoom webinar, not a Zoom meeting. So you'll notice that all the participants are muted. You can type questions into the Q&A feature at any time, and we encourage you to do that. We will um, keep track of those questions and we have time for questions at the end. If you're having any technical issues, please put those in the chat. And I will turn it over to Dr. Judah Sui. Thank you, Addy. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here today to talk to you all about screening and treatment of hepatitis C among people who use drugs. So I'd first like to start off with some acknowledgments and also disclosures. So many of the slides that I'm presenting were developed with my colleague, Dr. Jocelyn James, and also with support and input from the Washington State Department of Health. I do want to acknowledge that I'm the site PI of the HERO study, which is a study that looked at models of care for hepatitis C for people who inject drugs that was funded by the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute. That study did utilize medication that was donated by Gilead. And if there's time at the end, I will uh, present some results from that study, which recently came out. So I want to be very transparent about my training and background um, that have shaped my perspective. I am a primary care doctor and I'm also addiction medicine uh, specialist and my clinical and my research um, both focus on, in particular on patients with opioid use disorder and hepatitis C treatment. So I've been doing hepatitis C treatment for about um, two decades, and I've been a buprenorphine prescriber for about a decade. Next slide. So these are the goals for the session today. Hopefully by the end, you will, number one, be aware of hepatitis C elimination campaigns and the fact that prior authorization requirements and provider restrictions have been lifted. So it's a lot easier to treat patients for hepatitis C. Number two, understand why treating people who use drugs is critical for the reaching elimination. Number three, understand that all adults should be screened for hepatitis C and that nearly all patients with infection should be treated. Number four, be at least familiar with the new direct acting antivirals or DAAs, as I'll refer to them, uh, that we use that can cure most patients of hepatitis C and the key steps in treatment. And number five, lastly, and I think most importantly, I want you to be really excited to assist in the effort to screen and treat people with hepatitis C, um, and also to know where to go uh, for help. I'll put some resources up at the end. Next slide. So just a bit of background on the history of hepatitis C. Hepatitis C is an RNA virus that was first identified in the late 1980s. It is now the most common chronic bloodborne infection in the US. And it's currently estimated that about two to three million individuals in the US have hepatitis C, only about a half who may be aware of their infection. And globally, it's estimated that about 71 million are infected. Hepatitis C is unfortunately not vaccine preventable, unlike hepatitis A and B, for which um, vaccines are available and should be offered to all people who use drugs. After being exposed, approximately one in five will spontaneously clear their infection. And that's why it's critical to follow up screening antibody tests with a hepatitis C viral load to differentiate those individuals who have cleared. Unfortunately, the majority of those who are exposed to hepatitis C do become chronically infected. Next slide. <clears throat> 
So in the U.S. and other high-income countries, the primary mode of transmission for hepatitis C is through injecting drugs. So since 1992, blood products have been screened for hepatitis C in the U.S., but individuals who have received products prior to that time may be also at risk. There have been some outbreaks of hepatitis C associated with sex among men who have sex with men. Transmission rates among monogamous heterosexual couples um, have been reported in prior studies actually to be low. And older epidemiological studies uh, also demonstrated intranasal cocaine as a risk factor. But um, I do want to point out that um, by far and away the, the primary risk factor in the U.S. for hepatitis C, again, is um, injecting drugs. But the risk is not just through sharing needles and syringes. Um, it can also occur with sharing other injecting equipment, such as waters, cookers, cotton filters. So one should always remember to uh, educate on this issue as well. Next slide. So for many years after the discovery of hepatitis C, the rate of new cases was relatively low and the prevalence of disease was stable and concentrated in older adults, namely the baby boomer generation. However, unsurprisingly, with the emergence of the opioid epidemic, we've seen a rise in new hepatitis C cases, particularly among young adults. So this figure demonstrates the number of uh, new acute infections by age. And as you can see, the most dramatic increases are among those young adults less than 40 years of age. And keep in mind that uh, acute cases are really just the tip of the iceberg since most new infections are asymptomatic and not diagnosed at the time of um, acute infection. So um, as a consequence, we've seen a shift in cases towards young adults and a particularly in rural areas that have been hard hit by the opioid epidemic. Next slide. So this has come out really um, over the last decade. Uh, next slide. So here is some data from Washington State that clearly, clearly demonstrates the shift in epidemiology. In 2007, as you can see, the majority of chronic cases were concentrated in uh, middle-aged adults, namely that baby boomer generation. But by 2018, there was a shift to this bimodal distribution of cases among young adults and also the older baby boomer cohort. And really, this shift in epidemiology has been something that's been reported in uh, many states now, not just our own. Next slide. So this uh, increase among young adults is particularly concerning since hepatitis C is not a disease that necessarily impacts you immediately, but over decades, it can cause serious health complications. So these young adults, if not treated, will potentially suffer earlier mor morbidity from a treatable disease. So just to quickly review the natural history of chronic hepatitis C, around 15 to 30% of those with chronic hepatitis C will eventually develop cirrhosis over decades, usually decades of being infected. Among those with cirrhosis, the risk of developing hepatocellular carcinoma or liver cancer is three to five percent per year. And patients with hepatitis C and cirrhosis can also die from liver failure um, without a transplant. So uh, I want to point out um, that, Addie, if you can click, um, alcohol use uh, dramatically increases each of these risks for cirrhosis and for um, liver cancer and liver failure. Um, so that is something that's important to counsel patients about. And uh, let's see, yeah, and just to make the point again that individuals who are infected at a younger age are going to have more time uh, to develop complications. Next slide. <clears throat> 
So I'd like to also point out that in 2013, hepatitis C became the leading cause of infectious disease mortality, exceeding that of all other top infectious diseases, including HIV and tuberculosis combined. So this is something that I think um, people don't often realize and appreciate is the, the magnitude of the burden of this infection. Next slide. So it should also be mentioned that uh, hepatitis C is associated with non-liver related complications, um, sometimes referred to as extrahepatic manifestations. Um, and some of those are listed here. And these are conditions that can substantially impact health-related quality of health, um, as well as mortality. Next slide. So the benefits of curing hepatitis C are uh, multiple and substantial, and they include reducing all-cause mortality, positively impacting um, psychosocial health and quality of life, decreased inflammation and non-hepatic com uh, comorbidities, reduced transmission to others, which I'll talk about more in a minute, reduction in liver fibrosis and liver complications, and reduced incidence of liver cancer. Next slide. So talking a little bit more about the psychosocial benefits of hepatitis C treatment. Um, these are quite profound, I think, for people who use drugs. Um, treating and curing individuals of hepatitis C has been uh, described as um, having a powerful effect on self-efficacy and feelings of, of self-empowerment among patients. And I think we have to um, really appreciate how much um, treatment and cure benefits patients uh, from a perspective of, of uh, relieving the stigma and the anxiety that's associated with the stigma of having hepatitis C. And it can also have positive effects on their substance use. And Addie, if you can click, I think there's some quotes here um, that come from some qualitative studies interviewing patients with hepatitis C and substance use after they were treated. So one participant said, clearing hepatitis C will help in defeating the bigger problems because it's like trying to get up when you've got 100 bricks on you. And then if I took half the bricks off from hepatitis C, then now I've got a bit more movement and I can start taking the bricks off. And another quote, um, everything changed. I stopped drug use. I stopped everything because I said, if I beat the hep C, I could beat that too. Praise God today, to today, I feel so good. Next slide. So the other compelling argument for treating hepatitis C among people who use drugs is that it really is key to achieving the public health goal of hepatitis C elimination. That is because treating populations that actively transmit hepatitis C, by doing that, we reduce new infections, and that's how we can impact disease burden and prevalence over time. Next slide. So this concept is called treatment as prevention. And this is something that we saw uh, proven for HIV. So this slide shows data from colleagues in Canada, in Vancouver. The red line depicts the number of patients with HIV who were on uh, antiretroviral therapy, while the blue line shows the number of new HIV diagnoses. And as you can see, the new infection rate is inversely proportional to the increased number, uh, number of patients who are on ART. Next slide. So mathematical modeling of hepatitis C treatment has demonstrated that by increasing the rate of treatment among people who inject drugs, we can dramatically impact the prevalence of disease over time. So this figure um, shows data that 
uh, projects out different treatment rates among people who inject drugs, and it's um, based on data from Australia. What I'd like to point out is that even small differences in the rate of treatment, say varying from treating 10 out of 1,000 to 40 out of 1,000 yearly, can have a fairly dramatic impact on disease prevalence in decades to come. And in developed countries like Australia and our own, we certainly have the capacity to treat um, those amounts of patients. Next slide. So the revised guidelines uh, that have been put out clearly uh, reflect the need to treat all persons, including people who inject drugs. So the IDSA ASLD guidelines state, for all patients with chronic hepatitis C infection, except those with a short life expectancy that cannot be remediated by hepatitis C treatment or liver transplantation or another drug therapy, treatment is recommended. And they also say that scale up of hepatitis C treatment in, in persons who inject drugs is necessary to positively impact the HCV epidemic in the US and globally. Next slide. So despite these new guidelines, there still may be a fair amount of resistance to offering treatment for hepatitis C uh, to people who inject drugs. And I think that that's often related to the common misperceptions or myths that providers may hold. And so I think it's important that we talk about those and look at the evidence. So the first myth is that people who use substances can be effectively treated and, and cured. And the second myth is that people who use substances are likely to get uh, reinfected anyway. So ne let's look at the data. Uh, next slide. So for the belief that people who inject drugs can't be effective cured, um, you can animate this one, Addie. There have been uh, a number of studies now that have looked at treating uh, people who use drugs, who actively use drugs uh, with DEAs, and they've shown that they have um, similar cure rates to people who don't use drugs. So they have excellent cure rates um, around 90%. Um, so the first two studies that I've listed there are um, clinical trials. So we could argue that there is some bias with the types of um, uh, participants who get enrolled in those studies. Um, however, the HERO study, which I'll show you some slides on later, was uh, a comparative effectiveness study that looked at treating people who inject drugs in eight sites around the country. Um, and that study also showed very um, high cure rates among those patient-initiated treatment, around 90% um, for those who had uh, lab test results. So next slide to talk about the second myth that people who use substances are just likely to get reinfected anyway. Um, so there was a recent meta-analysis that was published um, just in 2020, and that included 36 studies, 19 of which were from the DA era. And that study showed that reinfection rates were generally low among people who use drugs around uh, six per 100 person years. So that means if you were to take 100 uh, people who use drugs, treat and cure them, and follow them up for a year later, only a six would be reinfected. Um, and furthermore, when they looked at persons who were on opioid, opioid agonist treatment, they saw that the rates were even lower. There were some uh, protective benefits of offering medications for opioid use disorder. Uh, next slide. And uh, so that's consistent with um, other multiple studies that have shown that medications for opioid use disorder, and namely this is methadone and buprenorphine, um, are effective in preventing primary infections as well. So there was a Cochrane systematic review that was done, done in 2017, and um, I actually had a study that contributed to that. But that clearly showed that um, 
uh, opioid agonist therapy reduces the risk for um, acquiring hepatitis C about half among people who use drugs. Next slide. Um, yeah, so you can move on to the next slide. So hopefully you can see that we are in a very unique point in history where we have the tools to treat and cure nearly all patients with hepatitis C, including people who inject drugs, and thus achieve disease elimination, which is really a unique opportunity. So we currently have a global initiative by WHO um, to try to eliminate hepatitis C by 2030. And actually, there are only a few countries that are really on target to meet this. Um, Iceland is one. We in the U.S. are not actually on target to meet that. Um, and so that is the, the definition of elimination uh, is what I have listed there. It's an 80% reduction in incidence and a 65% reduction in mortality. So here in Washington State, we are quite fortunate that we also have a statewide initiative um, that was announced in 2018 called Hep C Free Washington. And as part of that initiative, um, this, the state has recognized that people who inject drugs should be a priority population for treatment. Um, made some very important changes to Medicaid that should make it much easier to treat all patients. Probably the single most um, action that uh, was most important is that the state did contract with AbbVie, who are the makers of um, uh, GP, I'm not going to try to pronounce that there, um, or Maverick. And so what they did was to um, have a contract that some folks refer to as the Netflix model, um, which is a bit of a simplification. It reflects the basic concept that they pay a negotiated fee for treating a certain number of patients and then beyond that don't have to pay additional um, so while cost is a huge barrier in many states, here in Washington state, we're very lucky that um, we, the state has removed a lot of these financial barriers um, and wants to treat all patients. So as a result, it has also, Medicaid has removed um, a number of restrictions that should make it much easier to treat patients. Uh, next slide, I think I have a list of many of those changes. Um, yeah, and so these changes are all aligned with the, the guidance that has been put out um, by medical societies. Um, there's no longer any sort of sobriety or abstinence requirement, uh, and patients in, who use drugs or actively use drugs should be treated. There's no longer evident, uh, a requirement that patients have evidence of moderate or severe fibrosis, which, as you can imagine, effectively excluded the population of young adults who um, inject drugs who had recently been infected and not had infection long enough to have um, significant fibrosis. So they also removed the requirement that patients demonstrate evidence of chronic infection with a hepatitis C viral load six months apart. Um, and so that means that providers don't have to wait to treat patients. And even in the case of um, a patient with a possible acute infection who wants to be treated, they can still prescribe medications. Although, um, Overwhelmingly, most patients, um, when they get tested, are likely to um, have chronic infection. As you recall, um, four out of five will go on to have a chronic infection who are exposed. Um, and so then one of the other important um, changes that was made is that prior authorization for medications is not required for Maverick. Um, and any licensed prescriber now can um, treat. Um, it no longer has to be uh, only a specialist. So really primary care providers and addiction medicine providers, people who are really on the front lines of seeing and taking care of people who use drugs um, can now prescribe medications for hepatitis C. So next slide. 
so we have all of these really great changes that make it much easier to provide medications uh, for hepatitis C for people who use drugs, but how well are we doing? Um, unfortunately, studies show that we still have very persistent treatment gaps, um, both um, some screening and treatment gaps. So this is some data from a study that I did with colleagues here at UW um, using uh, CDC data from uh, a survey that's conducted every three months on people who inject drugs. And the survey included some questions about hepatitis C testing and treatment. And so this data comes from 2018, and among those 376 individuals who um, were screened and found to have hep C positive antibody through the study, um, the majority of them reported that they had been tested in the past, which is good news that it seems like we're doing a pretty good job screening people who inject drugs. Um, the majority of them were aware of their hepatitis C diagnosis, but not all, so we, there was some gap there. Um, but where we really saw a big drop off is in the percentage that um, had received any treatment or completed treatment. So of those who reported that they had been told that they had hepatitis C and they were aware that they had hepatitis C, only 26% had ever received any treatment and even less than that, 18% had completed treatment. So I think from this study, we can see that there's really an urgent need to connect people who are diagnosed with hepatitis C to rapid start of treatment and to offer treatment in settings where um, people who use drugs are seen. Next slide. So another thing to point out is that um, among people who use drugs, a great interest and desire for treatment. Um, and I think this slide is animated, so you'll have to click through. Yeah, so looking at data from the Washington State Syringe uh, Exchange Health Survey from 2019, of those individuals who used um, the syringe exchange, who presumably were people who inject drugs, 58% reported that they had been tested in the last year. Um, and very similar to the other study I showed you, of those who were diagnosed and knew about their infection, only 28% had received any hepatitis C treatment, but um, much larger percent reported interest in hepatitis C treatment. So clearly we're not doing an adequate job um, providing access to treatment for all those who want it. Next slide. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, treatment. This won't be um, in depth, but to just go over sort of the basic, the basics. So the direct acting antivirals for hepatitis C treat um, for hepatitis C have been around since around 2013, and um, there have been a number of different medication regimens that have come out since then. Um, but we're currently at a point where we have uh, two medications that are the medications that are most frequently used, which are both um, pan-genotypic medications. So they're uh, medications that work against all the different genotypes of hepatitis C. And hepatitis C comes in um, six different genotypes, although the most common of those are genotypes one, two, and three. Um, so now the typical, uh, the typical treatment duration is just 8 to 12 weeks, so very short. The usual pill burden is um, 1 to 3 pills taken once daily. Um, and the tolerability of these medications is excellent. There's um, very little side effects that are experienced, and those side effects are quite mild, usually things like headache, fatigue, occasionally nausea. And rarely they interfere with treatment course that patients have to discontinue due to, due to side effects. Um, 
the effectiveness of these medications is excellent and cure rates are uh, 90% or above. Um, and cure, just to review what the definition of that is, um, it's defined as um, it's uh, having a hepatitis C viral load 12 weeks after completing therapy that is undetectable. And so it's referred to as SVR12 or sustained virologic response 12. Next slide. So this is kind of a more um, quick summary of just how dramatically different the treatment paradigm is now compared to um, the previous decades. Um, prior to the DEAs, the treatment that we used was interferon-based. Um, it was a combination of interferon, which was a weekly shot, plus uh, ribavirin, which was a pill that was, um, or pills that were taken twice daily. And back then the treatment was for 24 to 48 weeks, so really long time. Um, and really side effects were the general rule, not the exception that most patients experience some side effects and the side effects were really severe. Um, they included things like depression, suicidality, flu-like symptoms, fatigue, hair loss, anemia, immunosuppression, um, et cetera. And at the end of the day, patients only had about a 50% chance of getting cured. So you can see how today this is dramatically different and this really has altered um, the risk benefit ratio dramatically so that we want to treat everyone. Next slide. So if you are um, considering doing treatment for hepatitis C, and I hope some of you are, um, it, it is important to think a little bit about uh, comfort level and what sorts of patients you would want to treat and what would want to refer. And the treatment as I'll go through is fairly straightforward for patients who are uncomplicated, um, but there are some patients who are complicated and should be referred to a specialist, um, such as a hepatologist um, or infectious disease list. So some reasons to refer patients who have decompensated cirrhosis, so not uh, not compensated cirrhosis, but individuals who are, say, child's B or C and have had evidence of um, ascites, jaundice, um, viral C hemorrhages, encephalopathy, et cetera. Um, any patient with liver cancer should be referred, obviously, or post-transplant. And then depending on sort of training and comfort, um, most likely you may want to refer patients who are co-infected with hepatitis B or HIV, um, have prior treatment with DAs, or have um, end-stage renal disease. Next slide. But for patients who are don't fall into those categories, um, it is quite straightforward nowadays to treat with the new medications. And um, so generally the pretreatment assessment, which even if you don't want to do hepatitis C treatment, this can be something that you can do even just to um, help the patient uh, get closer to being a point of being able to be treated. Um, that assessment is pretty straightforward generally um, consists of having uh, a CBC, um, a comprehensive metabolic panel, screening, uh, having a hepatitis C viral to demonstrate that the individual actually has a chronic infection, screening for HIV and for active hepatitis B with a hepatitis B surface antigen. Um, nowadays, it isn't imperative to get a hepatitis C genotype since, as I showed you earlier, um, both of the medications that are used are pangenotypic. However, there, I think there could be some argument made for getting the genotype um, in the population of people who inject drugs, mainly if they were to get um, to show up with a positive viral load at the SVR12 point, there's some sort of question if that could be a reinfection or if that's failed treatment. So differentiating with genotype can be helpful sometimes. Um, yeah, and then if there's concern for cirrhosis based on the history, um, then certainly you'd want to go further and order some additional blood tests um, and also do some um, 
testing for what we call staging of fibrosis. Um, so fibrosis uh, comes in four different stages and um, stage four is uh, cirrhosis. Um, stage three is early cirrhosis. And in order to uh, diagnose a patient with cirrhosis, you can do that with non-invasive indices such as uh, FIB4 or PRE, they're listed below, um, or you could also use something like a fiber scan, um, which is similar to an ultrasound um, and is non-invasive and done in an office-based setting. So next slide. Oh, so that's just the formula for FIB4. Um, and so then if you then proceed to treating patients who are straightforward without cirrhosis, um, the algorithm for treatment has also gotten a lot easier over the years. Um, so really the key steps are to review medications and supplements and assess for drug-drug interactions, which I'll show you on another slide, um, to update labs if they're not current. Uh, as previously described, and then to educate the patient about medication administration, adherence, and preventing it and reinfection. One thing to note is that the DAAs really are very powerful, and so increasingly we're realizing that um, adherence doesn't have to be perfect for patients to be treated and cured. However, um, studies have shown that adherence still matters, so it is important to um, to reinforce with patients that um, adherence is needed and to support them in whatever ways you can. So again, as mentioned earlier, there's basically two treatments uh, that are available. Um, GP, which is Maverick, which is generally for eight weeks, um, three pills once a day, or Sofosbuvir Valpatosphere, which is Clusa, which is for um, 12 weeks. And, and Really, for these straightforward patients without cirrhosis, there's no longer um, laboratory monitoring needed during treatment. Um, in the past, we would do um, tests at four weeks, eight weeks often during treatment, but the new um, guidelines for simplified treatment monitoring um, state that that's no longer necessary. You might um, want to check in the case of a patient you have questions about adherence. Um, that might be the only scenario. And um, yeah, so mainly during treatment, if you have visits, that's to offer support, assess symptoms, um, review if there are any new medications. Next slide. So um, if you can click ahead. Um, so the algorithm has also gotten more simplified for patients with compensated um, cirrhosis. So these are patients who are child A, who many providers um, would still feel comfortable treating. Again, child B or C you want to refer. Um, but the key differences here are that you need to do sort of a typical workup for a um, patient with um, child's B or C cirrhosis in that you will need to do a liver ultrasound to exclude hepatocellular carcinoma. And it would make sense to do that prior to treatment. Um, and then uh, labs need to be a little bit more current. Um, in the case of a patient with compensated cirrhosis, if they have um, genotype 3, um, that may be less responsive to occlusa and might require further resistance testing. And then um, there may be a slightly more higher risk for um, hepatic decompensation during treatment. So you could consider monitoring with uh, AST, ALT, hepatic panel every four weeks on treatment um, and uh, refer to a specialist if the enzymes increase. Next slide. So there are some common drug interactions that occur with both of these medications to be aware of. Um, and so some of those common ones would be um, uh, the statins for both the medications and then for Maverick, the oral contraceptives, and then for um, sofosbuvir, um, PPIs. 
Um, but as I'll touch on earlier, one key to feeling comfortable treating, I would say, as a primary care provider is that you establish a really good relationship with a pharmacist where you're going to be sending your prescriptions to. Um, and honestly, often the pharmacists will um, screen for these interactions and will counsel patients. Um, and if there's any question, you should certainly uh, refer to a pharmacist. Next slide. So um, post-treatment, again, uh, it is necessary to get a hepatitis C viral load um, 12 weeks after treatment to establish whether the patient has been cured. And so, again, having an undetectable viral load at that point um, denotes cure. Occasionally, patients may be cured, but their AST ALT will remain high. And in that case, you want to look for other causes. Um, and some other common causes, I would say, would be alcohol use or, um, uh, or, or um, diatohepatitis, um, non alcoholic fatty liver disease. So patients who don't have a cirrhosis, then at that point, if they're cured, there's no further liver workup that's required. And um, for patients who have cirrhosis, you know, you certainly want to continue to um, screen them in ways that are recommended for their cirrhosis. And uh, let's see, for... Um, for everyone, I mean, if a patient's not cured, then you're going to want to be um, referring to a specialist for treatment. And I should uh, mention that there is, for patients who fail treatment, there's another regimen, um, Vosefi, that is available uh, for patients. So they haven't burned all their bridges. Um, patients should still be counseled to avoid um, excess alcohol if they do have um, moderate to severe fibrosis, since um, that sort of risk uh, for cirrhosis doesn't go away. And um, for individuals who have risks for reinfection, as we talked about, such as people who use drugs, inject drugs, uh, they should be tested with hepatitis C viral load annually. Next slide. So we certainly can be proactive with our patients in preventing reinfection. Again, reinfection is not um, common, but it can happen, and we certainly want to avoid that. So um, just to you know, reiterate that you do want to be rescreening patients who have risk factors, and that has to be with a viral load, not with an antibody test, since that will remain positive lifelong. And we should really try to minimize the shame, I think, around reinfection. And some patients, you know, when you um, tell them that you'd like to retest them, they may feel like um, you're, you know, suspicious that they're using. So as much as possible to just say, this, these are the guidelines. We want to recheck you just to make sure you're still healthy. Um, and when patients do uh, experience reinfection, really to try to minimize um, any guilt or shame that they feel around that. Uh, also, we want to make sure to offer harm reduction services um, and certainly encourage uh, patients to be on medications for opioid use disorder. And certainly don't let reinfection be a uh, risk, be a barrier to treatment for this population. In some senses, if you do see some reinfection among patients, that gives you a sign that you're really treating uh, the right population, a, a population that's um, at high risk. So next slide. And then just a quick mention again, not to forget about hepatitis A and B, since those are vaccine preventable um, and they're recommended for all people who use drugs. And next slide. So um, hepatitis C treatment take-home points, there's now a simplified pathway with limited monitoring for most patients. Um, adherence supports are helpful, but DAs are pretty forgiving of imperfect adherence. Um, 
I will say that as a Hep C prescriber, it's extremely fun and gratifying to cure people of disease. It's not often we can do that. Um, and it also feels good to contribute to the public health goal of hepatitis C elimination. And so I would encourage you to think of hep C treatment as really a routine part of primary care, especially for people who um, have uh, substance use disorders. Next slide. So if you're interested in doing treatment, um, here's a list of some resources that can help you get started. Um, so there's uh, guidelines that are put out by IDSA and ASLD that are updated on a regular basis. Um, there's also an excellent resource that's offered through UW. Um, it's hepatitis C. Um, .uw.edu, and they offer free online training. Um, there's also Project ECHO, which is uh, a series of weekly video conferences and that's run out of UW where providers can present cases and have specialists weigh in, um, which can be a very um, a nice way to, to get pay, uh, providers comfortable with treatment. Um, there's also a phone consultation available through UCSF and um, some online medication interaction checkers. Next slide. So just a few tips as well. Um, just start with one straightforward case. You know, often it can just take one easy patient to make you feel more comfortable. Uh, find a local expert that could be through Project ECHO or could that could just be a colleague that does that. Um, next. And then again, like I was saying earlier, identify um, a pharmacist that you work with and make use of them. Um, next. And then, you know, decide on your scope of practice and when to refer. And if you have a patient who does seem more complicated, um, has comorbidities, there's certainly no shame in referring um, such patients out. Next. Okay, so conclusions. Um, Hope I've shown you that screening and treatment of hepatitis C among people who use drugs is critical for elimination. Um, you should be aware that all adults should be screened for hepatitis C. Um, I can't remember if I covered this, but that, that is actually a new guideline um, that all adults. Previously, the guidelines were that um, baby boomers uh, and people risk factors should be screened, but that's been changed so that the recommendation is um, all adults should have, at least have a uh, one-time screening. And uh, again, people who use drugs who are screened and found to be negative uh, should be continue to be screened regularly. And nearly all people who use drugs can be cured, um, just like people who do not use drugs with eight to 12 weeks of oral therapy with few side effects. And we can prevent reinfections through access to needle syringe programs and medications for opioid use disorder. And uh, in Washington state, the medications are readily available for all patients. Next slide. So um, I think I'll probably skip the HERO study slides. Addie, would you recommend that since it looks like we have just about 10 minutes left? Yeah, and I, I've um, chatted some questions to you. Um, I, could, I could read them out. Um, okay. First question, if a patient is admitted to a hospital with an abscess or other diagnosis related to IV DU, injection, drug use, um, and they have hep C, is it reasonable to ask the hospitalist to consider starting hepatitis C treatment while they are in the hospital? So that's a really good question. And that is something that I'm hearing um, a lot of conversations around these days. Um, I don't think the guidelines specifically address the scenario right now, although perhaps they might in the future. Um, and so I think at this 
point, it's a very reasonable thing to consider and would probably depend on the specifics of your setting, um, who, what the profile of the patient is, how motivated um, they are to get treatment, how long you expect them to be in the hospital, what the sort of discharge plan is, um, uh, you know, certainly you'd want the, the patient to discharge to a stable situation where they can manage their medications. Um, so I think it's not unreasonable would be my answer. Um, but I will say that I don't think, I haven't seen that done um, yet, at least on a widespread basis. I think people are still figuring that out. So we can expect more to come on that. It sounds like it's a it's a um, growing topic. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, I think you did talk a little bit about this, but a question about how does treatment adherence, consistency of taking the medicine, impact cure rates? Yeah. So the so there's going to be a lot more um, evidence coming out on this as well. Um, there is one paper that I saw was recently published on this. Um, the first author's name is Brianna Norton. Um, I know that the HERO study, um, we also have data on adherence as well. Um, it's a bit of a, a again, um, a sort of mixed bag where adherence is not, certainly patients don't need perfect adherence to get cured. And we know that most patients are not, you know, 100% adherent. Um, I think often in treatment, we, we do, we really strive to have patients take all their medications, all 84 doses, usually if it's a PLUSA. Um, but, um, we know that there might be some small interruptions. Um, there isn't sort of magic number around adherence like they, um, as far as I've seen yet, but um, I will say that certainly patients who, again, are not 100% adherent, who are say like 70, 80%, um, it seems that the majority of them will be cured. And we certainly have seen patients with even lower adherence rates even get cured um, anecdotally. So um, it, the, the medications do to appear to be very forgiving. On the other hand, the studies do show that adherence still matters, right? So if you have a patient who's not um, as an adherent, they are, they do have a slightly lower chance of being cured. So we don't, ideally we want all patients to get cured. So I think it's still really important to counsel patients that um, adherence matters and to make sure that we're helping them in whatever way we can um, be adherent, whether that be through uh, a patient, a patient um, navigator or case manager um, or, you know, creating systems like um, daily observe therapy in the methadone clinic, like giving hep C medications with methadone. Um, we want to create systems where patients are successful and get cured. Great. Um, in our last six minutes, I'm going to ask you, um, for those of us who aren't prescribers, but who are working with the population of people who inject drugs, um, what role do you see for us, the patient navigators or the nurses who are working with this patients in moving towards that goal of eliminating hepatitis C? Yeah, so you all can play a huge role in um, moving patients towards being cured. I think as I showed you, there's multiple steps still um, in the care cascade. And from, you know, just getting that screening test to confirming that the person actually has chronic infection um, with a viral load to um, making sure that they are linked to someone who can prescribe to medicine, medicines and 
also um, you know, making sure that they have all of those things that will allow them to be successful in treatment, such as housing and, you know, social supports and transportation. And um, so all of those things are critical for patients to both um, access treatment and to get cured. Um, and so it's going to take a village, I think. It's going to take all of us to um, support this population uh, to get folks cured, the, the person prescribing the medication. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for um, joining us today. And Dr. Sui's contact information is here. And we will post um, the recording of this uh, webinar today to learn about treatment.org. And we'll also be sending the slides out in a follow up email along with, I apologize, I'm going to um, zoom through some slides here uh, to get to the end. Um, along with registration links for some upcoming virtual events hosted by ADAI, we'll have on February 10th, we'll have a webinar by Dr. Perez from neighbor care about buprenorphine microdosing for opioid use disorder and pain. Microdosing is a, a newer strategy for helping people to start buprenorphine that's become um, popular. We've heard a lot of interest from various people about more on this topic. Um, and on February 26th, we will be having a conference on working effectively with people who use stimulants who are enrolled in medication for opioid use disorder um, programs. So look for those two registration links in the follow-up email. Um, not for registration in the email, but just to keep on your radar is we have two upcoming series, so not single calls, but series in spring of 2021. One will be improving psychiatric care for um, patients with opioid use disorder, and the other will be an adolescent medication for opioid use disorder learning collaborative. So um, please keep those. Um, on your mind as future training opportunities. And with that, we will conclude today's webinar. Thank you so much, Dr. Sui, for joining us today. It was really wonderful to have you. Thank you for inviting me.